Most recent data from the CDC suggests that the autism prevalence in the United States amongst eight-year-olds is about 1 in 36, or 2.78%. In 2000, the CDC had estimated it was about 1 in 150 children, or about 0.67%. This leads most to wonder, why are there so many people with autism now? My name is Stephanie, and I am an autistic adult, advocate, and certified occupational therapy assistant. Today is World Autism Awareness or Acceptance Day, and I'd like to address that question for you. You may feel like these netizens who commented, why is autism now one in 32 children? That's absolutely insane. We need to find the reason this is happening to our children. I was born in 1983, and I'll tell you what, autism is something new. Something within the last 20 years has made autism explode. Our children shouldn't be getting autism or cancer. Let's find out who and why our children are being poisoned. The absurd idea that a deathly disease and a neurodevelopmental condition are somehow equal aside, many people are now hearing about autism or seeing autistic people in families, and this is somewhat new to them. They don't remember hearing about this when they were younger, and this makes them conclude that this means that autism itself is something new. And in some ways, technically, autism is new. Let me explain. In 1911, the word autism was first used as a descriptor for a set of symptoms that was associated with schizophrenia. 1926 is when the first known description of autistic children was ever published by someone named Grunia Sukreva. And in 1950, autism was considered to be some form of childhood schizophrenia. Up until the 1950s and 60s, when deinstitutionalization began, those who were considered to be mentally or emotionally disturbed, basically those who had different types of mental illness and disabilities that weren't well understood, were kept away in institutions. And of course, this would mean that many people didn't see them in their communities. It wasn't until 1980 that autism was separated from schizophrenia in the literature. Those types of technical updates take a lot of time to become more public knowledge. They take time as it is when it comes to professionals and implementing that, let alone the average person understanding that autism is a thing. Despite the earlier dates of deinstitutionalization beginning, even in 2000, 38% of people who were classified as having intellectual or developmental disabilities were in either public or private institutions. Fast forward to 2019, and only about 8% of those who are identified as having IDD or intellectual or developmental disabilities, and keep in mind that autism is considered a developmental disability, resided in institutions, and about 16% lived in group homes. That means there's been a, quite the influx of people who have previously been hidden away now in their communities compared to the times that many of these people are referencing. Another thing to consider time-wise is that the Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network, or the ADDM network, that the CDC uses as a primary source of prevalence data only began operating in the year 2000. This includes the changes that came about with the publishing of the DSM-5, which took Asperger syndrome, PDD, NOS, and autistic disorder, and put them all together under one term, autism spectrum disorder. And this updated our understanding of what autism is and as well the diagnostic criteria. As a side note, it's important to know that other countries don't all use the DSM like the United States. They often use the ICD, which previously the ICD-10 did have Asperger's as a separate diagnosis from autism. However, this has changed with the ICD-11, which just began taking effect in 2022, which means it's probably going to take some time for it to be actually disseminated and used more widely in other countries to put Asperger's under autism spectrum disorder. The data for estimating autism prevalence in the United States from 2000 to 2020 looks like this. I've added a line to show when the DSM-5 was published in relation to the data gathered by the ADDM, 
which is likely a factor and criteria for inclusion in prevalence data. Another thing to note is that the ADDM and other sources are always working to improve their methods in an attempt to more accurately report on prevalence. Historically, data has indicated that non-Hispanic white children have been diagnosed in higher numbers compared to other ethnicities, despite there being no real evidence that autism and ethnicity are necessarily correlated. So being a certain ethnicity doesn't necessarily increase or decrease your chance of having autism. Something interesting to note, however, is that the most recent data actually shows an uptick in other ethnicities that actually exceeds that of those who are considered to be non-Hispanic white. This is probably reflecting a change from increase in diagnosis due to an increase in understanding and awareness in populations that have previously been underserved. Different sources of autism prevalence data and how they are interpreted have also added to the confusion around prevalence as well. For example, the ADDM numbers are specifically for four-year and eight-year-olds and can't really be extrapolated or applied to different age groups because those age groups weren't included in their data collection. This brings me to another thing I wanted to mention is that one of the commenters that I mentioned at the beginning of the video mentioned a data point that I hadn't really heard before, which is like one in 32. So I'm not really sure what source they're referencing for that particular data point. However, there is a 2022 article that published a 1 in 30 number and also claimed that autism jumped 50%. Article cites a review of the data from the National Health Interview Survey, or NHIS, which is another one of those sources for prevalence data. That research article reported that the prevalence of ASD dipped from 2.76% in 2016, to 2.29% in 2017, then jumped from 2.29% in 2017 to 3.49% in 2020, as pointed out by a letter to the editor finding that the data should be interpreted with caution. The author of the response cautioning against running with the data also noted that another recent study utilizing the National Survey of Children's Health, or NSCH data, which is yet another data set, found instead that ASD diagnoses were actually stable from 2016 to 2020, only ranging from 2.5% to 2.7% over those four years. On the global scale, a 2022 research article suggests that global autism prevalence is about 1%, although one must consider the awareness and the screening measures that are available in other countries, as well as countries that even collect this kind of data. A 2021 study, including over 7 million school children in England, found a 1.76% prevalence, and they were also a bit disappointed to see that their information was not included in the global research paper. So there's always extra sources and things that can get missed and other data points to uh, consider as well. So while it is true that autism numbers have increased, a large reason for this is leaps in our understanding of what autism even is, changes in criteria, and advancement in early identification and intervention. So while it's understandable why someone born in 1980 might find autism to be new, it's no sudden onset or increase or conspiracy. It's just a progression of our understanding of what autism is and our identification of autism in individuals, as well as the inclusion of people in their own communities. Now, as for the claim that someone's like poisoning our children and that's why they're becoming autistic, it's pretty much a baseless claim. We've gone through a long journey of trying to understand how autism occurs in people, and it's still ongoing. But what we do know is that it is one of the most highly heritable conditions, with heritability percentages lying comfortably around 80% and estimated to be up to 91%. Among all of these different studies that people have been doing, there is little to no evidence of any sort of common across-the-board environmental factor or anything in common otherwise that could be causing or some kind of causal factor for autism. Some risk factors have been identified, but 
Often the data and findings of different studies are rather conflicting. Very recent genetic research shows that some heritable variants that are present in the parents and siblings of autistic people are for some reason inherited more in the autistic person would be expected, as well as some gene mutations that do happen individually in autistic people, as well as a large combination and many different types of combinations of genes that have been marked. And no, it's not vaccines. This has been repeatedly looked into over many years, and it has been conclusively found that there is no link between autism and vaccines. I hope this helped answer your questions about why autism is so prevalent now. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and drop a like, and feel free to subscribe if you're interested in hearing more about autism and autism-related topics. I hope that you have a wonderful World Autism Awareness slash Acceptance Day and week and I guess rest of your month. Bye.